what it is to pray with the understanding and now to the next thing, what it is to pray with the Spirit, and to pray with the understanding also. For the Apostle puts a clear distinction between praying with the Spirit and praying with the Spirit and understanding. Therefore, when he saith he will pray with the Spirit, he adds, and I will pray with the understanding also. This distinction was occasioned through the Corinthians not observing that it was their duty to do what they did to the edification of themselves and others too, whereas they did it for their own commendations. So I judge, for many of them having extraordinary gifts, as to speak with divers tongues, etc., therefore, they were more for those mighty gifts than they were for the edifying of their brethren. This was the cause that Paul wrote this chapter to them, to let them understand, that though extraordinary gifts were excellent, yet to do what they did to the edification of the church was more excellent. For, saith the apostle, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding, and also the understanding of others, is unfruitful. Therefore, I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. It is expedient then that the understanding should be occupied in prayer, as well as the heart and mouth. I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. That which is done with understanding is done more effectually, sensibly, and heartily, as I shall show farther anon, than that which is done without it. This made the Apostle pray for the Colossians, that God would fill them with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. And for the Ephesians, that God would give unto them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17. And so for the Philippians, that God would make them abound in knowledge and in all judgment. Philippians chapter 1 verse 9. A suitable understanding is good in everything a man undertakes, either civil or spiritual, and, therefore, it must be desired by all them that would be a praying people. In my speaking to this, I shall show you what it is to pray with understanding. Understanding is to be taken both for speaking in our mother tongue, and also experimentally. I pass the first and treat only on the second. For the making of right prayers, it is to be required that there should be a good or spiritual understanding in all them who pray to God. First, to pray with understanding is to pray as being instructed by the Spirit in the understanding of the want of those things which the soul is to pray for. Though a man be in never so much need of pardon of sin and deliverance from wrath to come, yet if he understand not this he will either not desire them at all, or else be so cold and lukewarm in his desires after them that God will even loathe his frame of spirit in asking for them. Thus it was with the church of the Laodiceans. They wanted knowledge or spiritual understanding. They knew not that they were poor, wretched, blind, and naked. The cause whereof made them and all their services so loathsome to Christ that he threatens to spew them out of his mouth, Revelations 3:16 and 17. Men without understanding may say the same words in prayer as others do. But if there be an understanding in the one, and none in the other, there is, oh, there is, a mighty difference in speaking the very same words. The one speaking from a spiritual understanding of those things that he in words desires, and the other words it only, and there is all. Second. Spiritual understanding espeth in the heart of God a readiness and willingness to give those things to the soul that it stands in need of. David by this could guess at the very thoughts of God towards him, Psalms 40-5. And thus it was with the woman of Canaan. She did by faith and a right understanding discern, beyond, d all the rough carriage of Christ, tenderness and willingness in his heart to save which caused her to be vehement and earnest, yea, restless, until she did enjoy the mercy she stood in need of, Matthew chapter 15 verse 22 to 28. And there is nothing will press the soul more to seek after God and to cry for pardon, 
than understanding of the willingness that is in the heart of God to save sinners. If a man should see a pearl worth an hundred pounds lie in a ditch, yet if he understood not the value of it, he would lightly pass it by. But if he once get the knowledge of it, he would venture up to the neck for it. So it is with souls concerning the things of God. If a man once get an understanding of the worth of them, then his heart, nay, the very strength of his soul, runs after them, and he will never leave crying till he have them. The two blind men in the gospel, because they did certainly know that Jesus, who was going by them, was both able and willing to heal such infirmities as they were afflicted with, therefore they cried, and the more they were rebuked, the more they cried, Matthew chapter 20 verse 29 to 31. Third, the understanding being spiritually enlightened, hereby there is the way, as aforesaid, discovered, through which the soul should come unto God, which gives great encouragement unto it. Otherwise, it is with a poor soul, as with one who hath a work to do, and if it be not done, the danger is great, if it be done, so is the advantage. But he knows not how to begin, nor how to proceed, and so, through discouragement, lets all alone, and runs the hazard. Fourth, the enlightened understanding sees largeness enough in the promises to encourage it to pray, which still adds to its strength to strength. As when men promise such and such things to all that will come for them, it is great encouragement to those that know what promises are made, to come and ask for them. Fifth, the understanding being enlightened, way is made for the soul to come to God with suitable arguments, sometimes in a way of expostulation, as Jacob, Genesis chapter 32 verse 9. Sometimes in way of supplication, yet not in a verbal way only, but even from the heart there is forced by the Spirit, through the understanding, such effectual arguments as moveth the heart of God. When Ephraim gets a right understanding of his own unseemly carriages towards the Lord, then he begins to bemoan himself. And in bemoaning of himself, he used such arguments with the Lord, that it affects his heart, draws out forgiveness, and makes Ephraim pleasant in his eyes through Jesus Christ our Lord. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus, saith God, Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised, as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. Surely after that I was turned, I repented, and after that I was instructed, or had a right understanding of myself, I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth, Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 18 and 19. These be Ephraim's complaints and bemoanings of himself, at which the Lord breaks forth into these heart-melting expressions, saying, Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord, Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 20. Thus, you see, that as it is required to pray with the Spirit, so it is to pray with the understanding also. And to illustrate what hath been spoken by a similitude, set the case, there should come two a begging to your door. The one is a poor, lame, wounded, and almost starved creature. The other is a healthful lusty person. These two use the same words in their begging. The one, saith he, is almost starved, so doth the other. But yet, the man that is indeed the poor, lame, or maimed person, he speaks with more sense, feeling, and understanding of the misery that is mentioned. In their begging than the other can do, and it is discovered more by his affectionate speaking, his bemoaning himself. His pain and poverty make him speak more in a spirit of lamentation than the other, and he shall be pitied sooner than the other by all those that have the least dram ten of natural affection or pity. Just thus it is with God. There are some who out of custom and formality go and pray. 
There are others who go in the bitterness of their spirits. The one, he prays out of bare notion and naked knowledge. The other half his words forced from him by the anguish of his soul. Surely that is the man that God will look at, even to him that is poor, of an humble, and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Isaiah chapter 66 verse 2. 6. An understanding well enlightened is of admirable use also, both as to the matter and manner of prayer. He that hath his understanding well exercised to discern between good and evil, and in it placed a sense either of the misery of man or the mercy of God, that soul hath no need of the writings of other men to teach him by forms of prayer. For as he that feels the pain needs not to be taught to cry, Oh! Even so he that hath his understanding opened by the Spirit needs not so to be taught of other men's prayers, as that he cannot pray without them. The present sense, feeling, and pressure that leath upon his spirit provokes him to groan out his request unto the Lord. When David had the pains of hell catching hold on him and the sorrows of hell compassing him about, he needs not a bishop in a surplice to teach him to say, O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul, Psalms 116-3-4, or to look into a book to teach him in a form to pour out his heart before God. It is the nature of the heart of sick men, in their pain and sickness, to vent itself for ease by dolorous groans and complainings to them that stand by. Thus it was with David in Psalm chapter 38 verse 1 to 12. And thus, blessed be the Lord, it is with them that are endued with the grace of God. Seventh, it is necessary that there be an enlightened understanding, to the end that the soul be kept in a continuation of the duty of prayer. The people of God are not ignorant how many wiles, tricks, and temptations the devil hath to make a poor soul who is truly willing to have the Lord Jesus Christ, and that upon Christ's terms too, I say, to tempt that soul to be weary of seeking the face of God, and to think that God is not willing to have mercy on such a one as him. I, saith Satan, thou mayest pray indeed, but thou shalt not prevail. Thou seest thine heart as hard, cold, dull, and dread. Thou dost not pray with the Spirit. Thou dost not pray in good earnest. Thy thoughts are running after other things when thou pretendest to pray to God. Away, hypocrite, go no further, it is but in vain to strive any longer. Here, now, if the soul be not well informed in its understanding, it will presently cry out, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Isaiah chapter 49 verse 14. Whereas the soul rightly informed and enlightened saith, Well, I will seek the Lord, and wait. I will not leave off, though the Lord keep silence, and speak not one word of comfort. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 27. He loved Jacob dearly, and yet he made him wrestle before he had the blessing. Genesis chapter 32 verse 25 to 27. Seeming delays in God are no tokens of his displeasure. He may hide his face from his dearest saints, Isaiah chapter 8 verse 17. He loves to keep his people praying, and to find them ever knocking at the gate of heaven. It may be, says the soul, the Lord tries me, or he loves to hear me groan out my condition before him. The woman of Canaan would not take seeming denials for real ones, Matthew chapter 15 verses 21 to 28. She knew the Lord was gracious, and the Lord will avenge his people, though he bear long with them, Luke chapter 18 verses 1 to 6. The Lord hath waited longer upon me than I have waited upon him. And thus it was with David. I waited patiently, saith he. That is, it was long. Before the Lord answered me, though at the last, he inclined, his ear, unto me, and heard my cry, Psalms 40 to 1. And the most excellent remedy for this is an understanding well informed and enlightened. Alas! How many poor souls are there in the world that truly fear the Lord? 
who, because they are not well informed in their understanding, are oft ready to give up all for lost, upon almost every trick and temptation of Satan. The Lord pity them, and help them to, pray with the Spirit, and, with the understanding also. Much of mine own experience could I here discover. When I have been in my fits of agony of spirit, I have been strongly persuaded to leave off, and to seek the Lord no longer. But being made to understand what great sinners the Lord hath had mercy upon, and how large his promises were still to sinners, and that it was not the whole, but the sick, not the righteous, but the sinner, not the full, but the empty, that he extended his grace and mercy unto. This made me, through the assistance of his Holy Spirit, to cleave to him, to hang upon him, and yet to cry, though for the present he made no answer. And the Lord help all his poor, tempted, and afflicted people to do the like, and to continue, though it be long, according to the saying of the prophet. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3. And, may he, help them, to that end, to pray, not by the inventions of men and their stinted forms, but, with the spirit, and, with the understanding also. Queries and objections answered and now to answer a query or two, and so to pass on to the next thing. First query. But what would you have us poor creatures to do that cannot tell how to pray? The Lord knows I know not either how to pray, or what to pray for. Answer. Poor heart. Thou canst not, thou complainest, pray. Canst thou see thy misery? Hath God showed thee that thou art by nature under the curse of his law? If so, do not mistake, I know thou dost groan and that most bitterly. I am persuaded thou canst scarcely be found doing anything in thy calling but prayer break it from thy heart. Have not thy groans gone up to heaven from every corner of thy house? Romans chapter 8 verse 26. I know it is thus, and so also doth thine own sorrowful heart witness thy tears, thy forgetfulness of thy calling, etc. Is not thy heart so full of desires after the things of another world, that many times thou dost even forget the things of this world? Prithee 17 read this scripture. Job chapter 23 verse 12. Second query. Yea, but when I go into secret, and intend to pour out my soul before God, I can scarce say anything at all. 1. Ah, sweet soul, it is not thy words that God so much regards, as that he will not mind thee except thou comest before him with some eloquent oration. His eye is on the brokenness of thine heart, and that it is that makes the very bowels of the Lord to run over. A broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise, Psalms 51-17. 2. The stopping of thy words may arise from overmuch trouble in thy heart. David was so troubled sometimes, that he could not speak, Psalms 77-34. But this may comfort all such sorrowful hearts as thou art, that though thou canst not through the anguish of thy spirit speak much, yet the Holy Spirit stirs up in thine heart groans and sighs, so much the more vehement. When the mouth is hindered, yet the spirit is not. Moses, as aforesaid, made heaven ring again with his prayers, when, that we read of, not one word came out of his mouth, Exodus chapter 14 verse 15. But, 3. If thou wouldst more fully express thyself before the Lord, study, first, thy filthy estate. Secondly, God's promises. Thirdly, the heart of Christ. Which thou mayest know or discern. 1. By his condescension and bloodshed. 2. By the mercy he hath extended to great sinners formerly and plead thine own vileness, by way of bemoaning, Christ's blood by way of expostulation, and in thy prayers, let the mercy that he hath extended to other great sinners, together with his rich promises of grace, be much upon thy heart. Yet let me counsel thee. 1. Take heed that thou content not thyself with words. 2. 
that thou do not think that God looks only at them either. But, 3. However, whether thy words be few or many, let thine heart go with them, and then shalt thou seek him, and find him, when thou shalt seek him with thy whole heart. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 13. Objection. But though you have seemed to speak against any other way of praying but by the Spirit, yet here you yourself can give direction how to pray. Answer. We ought to prompt one another forward to prayer, though we ought not to make for each other forms of prayer. To exhort to pray with Christian direction is one thing, and to make stinted forms for the tying up the Spirit of God to them is another thing. The Apostle gives them no form to pray with all, yet directs to prayer. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18 and Romans chapter 15 verse 30 to 32. Let no man therefore conclude that, because we may with allowance give instructions and directions to pray, therefore it is lawful to make for each other forms of prayer. Objection. But if we do not use forms of prayer, how shall we teach our children to pray? Answer. My judgment is that men go the wrong way to teach their children to pray in going about so soon to teach them any set company of words, as is the common use of poor creatures to do. For to me it seems to be a better way for people betimes nineteen to tell their children what cursed creatures they are, and how they are under the wrath of God by reason of original and actual sin. Also to tell them the nature of God's wrath, and the duration of the misery, which if they conscientiously do, they would sooner teach their children to pray than they do. The way that men learn to pray is by conviction for sin, and this is the way to make our sweet babes do so too. But the other way, namely, to be busy in teaching children forms of prayer before they know anything else is the next way to make them cursed hypocrites, and to puff them up with pride. Teach therefore your children to know their wretched state and condition. Tell them of hell fire and their sins, of damnation, and salvation. The way to escape the one, and to enjoy the other, if you know it yourselves, and this will make tears run down your sweet babe's eyes, and hearty groans flow from their hearts. And then also you may tell them to whom they should pray, and through whom they should pray. You may tell them also of God's promises, and his former grace extended to sinners, according to the word. Ah, poor sweet babes, the Lord open their eyes, and make them holy Christians. Seth David, come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord, Psalms 34-11. He doth not say, I will muzzle you up in a form of prayer but, I will teach you the fear of the Lord, which is, to see their sad states by nature, and to be instructed in the truth of the gospel, which doth through the Spirit beget prayer in everyone that in truth learns it. And the more you teach them this, the more will their hearts run out to God in prayer. God never did account Paul a praying man until he was a convinced and converted man. No more will it be with any else. Acts chapter 9 verse 11. Objection. But we find that the disciples desired that Christ would teach them to pray, as John also taught his disciples, and that thereupon he taught them that form called the Lord's Prayer. Answer. 1. To be taught by Christ is that which not only they but we, also, desire. And seeing he is not here in his person to teach us, the Lord teach us by his word and spirit. For the Spirit it is which he hath said he would send to supply in his room when he went away, as it is, John chapter 14 verse 16, and 16 to 7. 2. As to that called a form, I cannot think that Christ intended it as a stinted form of prayer. 1. Because he himself layeth it down diversely, as is to be seen, if you compare Matthew chapter 6 and Luke chapter 11. Whereas if he intended it as a set form, it must not have been so laid down, f. Or a set form is so many words and no more. 2. We do not find that the apostles did ever observe it as such, neither did they admonish. Subsequent words of the aforementioned article, 
it is called a most wholesome doctrine, and very full of comfort, and so it is to all that are weary and heavy laden, and are truly willing to find rest in Jesus Christ. This is gospel. This is glad tidings of great joy to all that feel themselves poor, lost, undone, damned sinners. Ho! Every one that thirsteth, come unto the waters of life, and drink freely. Come and buy without money and without price. Behold a fountain opened in your Saviour's side, for sin and for all uncleanness. Look unto him whom you have pierced. Look unto him by faith, and verily you shall be saved, though you came here only to ridicule and blaspheme, and never thought of God or of Christ before. Not that you must think God will save you because, or on account of your faith, for faith is a work, and then you would be justified for your works, but when I tell you, we are to be justified by faith, I mean that faith is the instrument whereby the sinner applies or brings home the redemption of Jesus Christ to his heart. And to whomsoever God gives such a faith, for it is the free gift of God, he may lift up his head with boldness, he need not fear. He is a spiritual son of our spiritual David. He is passed from death to life, he shall never come into condemnation. This is the gospel which we preach. If any man or angel preach any other gospel, than this of our being freely justified through faith in Christ Jesus, we have the authority of the greatest apostle, to pronounce him accursed. And now, my brethren, what think you of this foolishness of preaching? To you that have tasted the good word of life, who have been enlightened to see the riches of God's free grace in Christ Jesus, I am persuaded it is precious, and has distilled like the dew into your souls. And oh that all were like-minded! But I am afraid, numbers are ready to go away contradicting and blaspheming. Tell me, are there not many of you saying within yourselves, this is a licentious doctrine. This preacher is opening a door for encouragement in sin. But this does not surprise me at all, it is a stale, antiquated objection, as old as the doctrine of justification itself. And, which by the way is not much to the credit of those who urge it now, it was made by an infidel. Saint Paul, in his epistle to the Romans, after he had, in the first five chapters, demonstrably proved the doctrine of justification by faith alone. In the sixth, brings in an unbeliever saying, Shall we continue in sin then, that grace may abound? But as he rejected such an inference with a God forbid, so do I. For the faith which we preach, is not a dead speculative faith, an assenting to things credible, as credible, as it is commonly defined. It is not a faith of the head only but a faith of the heart. It is a living principle wrought in the soul, by the Spirit of the ever-living God, convincing the sinner of his lost, undone condition by nature, enabling him to apply and lay hold on the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, freely offered him in the gospel, and continually exciting him, out of a principle of love and gratitude, to show forth that faith, by abounding in every good word and work. This is the sum and substance of the doctrine that has been delivered. And if this be a licentious doctrine, judge ye. No, my brethren, this is not destroying, but teaching you how to do good works, from a proper principle. For to use the words of our church in another of her articles, works done before the grace of Christ, and the inspiration of the Spirit, are not pleasant to God for as much as they spring not of faith in Jesus Christ. Rather, for that they are not done as God has willed and commanded them to be done, we doubt not but they have the nature of sin. So that they who bid you do, and then live, are just as wise as those who would persuade you to build a beautiful magnificent house, without laying a foundation. It is true, the doctrine o. f. our free justification by faith in Christ Jesus like other gospel truths, may and will be abused by men of corrupt minds, reprobates concerning the faith. But they who receive the truth of God in the love of it, will always be showing their faith by their works. For this reason, Saint Paul, 
after he had told the Ephesians, by grace they were saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast, immediately adds, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And in his epistle to Titus, having given him directions to tell the people they were justified by grace, directly subjoins, chap. 3, Veer. 8. I will that you affirm constantly, that they who have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Agreeable to this, we are told in our twelfth article, that albeit good works, which are the fruits of faith, and follow after justification, cannot put away our sins, and endure the severity of God's judgment. Yet are they pleasing and acceptable to God in Christ, and do spring necessarily out of a true and lively faith, insomuch, that a lively faith may be as evidently known by them, as a tree discerned by the fruit. What would I give, that this article was duly understood and preached by all that have subscribed to it? The ark of the Lord would not then be driven into the wilderness, nor would so many persons dissent from the Church of England. For I am fully persuaded, that it is not so much on account of rites and ceremonies, as are not preaching the truth as it is in Jesus, that so many have been obliged to go and seek for food elsewhere. Did not we fall from our established doctrines, few, comparatively speaking, would fall from the established church. Where Christ is preached, though it be in a church or on a common, dissenters of all denominations have, and do must freely come. But if our clergy will preach only the law, and not show the way of salvation by faith in Christ, the charge of schism at the day of judgment, I fear, will chiefly lie at their door. The true sheep of Christ know the voice of Christ's true shepherds, and strangers they will not hear. Observe, my dear brethren, the words of the article, good works are the fruits of faith, and follow after justification. How then can they proceed, or be any way the cause of it? Our persons must be justified, before our performances can be accepted. God had respect to Abel before he had respect to his offering, and therefore the righteousness of Jesus Christ must be freely imputed to, and apprehended by us through faith, before we can offer an acceptable sacrifice to God. For out of Christ, as I hinted before, God is a consuming fire, and whatsoever is not of faith in Christ, is sin. That people mistake the doctrine of free justification, I believe, is partly owing to their not rightly considering the different persons to whom St. Paul and St. James wrote in their epistles, as also the different kind of justification each of them writes about. The former effects in line upon line, argument upon argument, that we are justified by faith alone. The latter put this question, was not Abraham justified by works? From whence many, not considering the different views of these holy men, and the different persons they wrote to, have blended and joined faith and works, in order to justify us in the sight of God. But this is a capital mistake. For Saint Paul was writing to the Jewish proselytes, who sought righteousness by the works, not of the ceremonial only, but of the moral law. In contradistinction to that, he tells them, they were to look for justification in God's sight, only by the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ apprehended by faith. Saint James had a different set of people to deal with, such who abused the doctrines of free justification, and thought they should be saved, as numbers among us do now upon their barely professing to believe on Jesus Christ. These the holy apostle endeavors W. Isley to convince, that such a faith was only a dead and false faith, and therefore, it behooved all who would be blessed with faithful Abraham, to show forth their faith by their works, as he did. For was not Abraham justified by works? Did he not prove that his faith was a true justifying faith, by its being productive of good works? From whence it is plain, that Saint James is talking of a declarative justification before men. Show me, demonstrate, evidence to me, that thou hast a true faith, by thy works. 
whereas Saint Paul is talking only of our being justified in the sight of God, and thus he proves that Abraham, as we also are to be, was justified before ever the moral or ceremonial law was given to the Jews, for it is written, Abraham believed in the Lord, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Take the substance of what has been said on this head, in the few following words. Every man that is saved, is justified three ways. First, meritoriously, by the death of Jesus Christ. It is the blood of Jesus Christ alone that cleanses us from all sin. Secondly, instrumentally, by faith. Faith is the means or instrument whereby the merits of Jesus Christ are applied to the sinner's heart. Ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Thirdly, we are justified declaratively. Namely, by good works. Good works declare and prove to the world, that our faith is a true saving faith. Was not Abraham justified by works? And again, show me thy faith by thy works. It may not be improper to illustrate this doctrine by an example or two. I suppose no one will pretend to say, that there was any fitness for salvation in Zacchaeus the publican, when he came to see Jesus out of no better principle, than that whereby perhaps thousands are led to hear me preach. I mean, curiosity. But Jesus Christ prevented and called him by his free grace, and sweetly, but irresistibly inclined him to obey that call. As, I pray God, he may influence all you that come only to see who the preacher is. Zacchaeus received our Lord joyfully into his house, and at the same time by faith received him into his heart. Zacchaeus was then freely justified in the sight of God. But behold the immediate fruits of that justification. He stands forth in the midst and as before he had believed in his heart, he now makes confession with his mouth to salvation. Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give unto the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And thus it will be with thee, O believer, as soon as ever God's dear Son is revealed in thee by a living faith. Thou wilt have no rest in thy spirit, till out of love and gratitude for what God has done for thy soul, thou showest forth thy faith by thy works. Again, I suppose every body will grant there was no fitness for salvation in the persecutor Saul. No more than there is in those persecuting zealots of these last days, who are already breathing out threatenings, and, if in their power, would breathe out slaughter also, against the disciples of the Lord. Now our Lord, we know, freely prevented him by his grace, and oh that he would thus effectually call the persecutors of this generation and by a light from heaven struck him to the ground. At the same time, by his spirit, he pricked him to the heart, convinced him of sin, and caused him to cry out, Who art thou, Lord? Christ replies, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Faith then was instantaneously given to him, and behold, immediately Saul cries out, Lord, what wouldst thou have me to do? and so will every poor soul that believes on the Lord Jesus with his whole heart. He will be always asking, Lord, what shall I do for thee? Lord, what wouldst thou have me to do? Not to justify himself, but only to evidence the sincerity of his love and thankfulness to his all-merciful high priest, for plucking him as a firebrand out of the fire. Perhaps many self are, righteous persons amongst you, may flatter yourselves, that you are not so wicked as either Zacchaeus or Saul was, and consequently there is a greater fitness for salvation in you than in them. But if you think thus, indeed you think more highly of yourselves than you ought to think. For by nature we are all alike, all equally fallen short of the glory of God, all equally dead in trespasses and sins, and there needs the same almighty power to be exerted in converting any one of the most sober, good-natured, moral persons here present, as there was in converting the publican Zacchaeus, or that notorious persecutor Saul. And was it possible for you to ascend into the highest heaven, 
and to inquire of the spirits of just men made perfect, I am persuaded they would tell you this doctrine is from God. But we have a more sure word of prophecy, to which we do well to give heed, as unto a light shining in a dark place. My brethren, the word is nigh you. Search the scriptures. Beg of God to make you willing to be saved in this day of his power. For it is not flesh and blood, but the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that alone can reveal these things unto you. Fourthly and lastly, what think you of Jesus Christ being formed within you? For whom Christ justifies, them he also sanctifies. Although he finds, yet he does not leave us unholy. A true Christian may not so properly be said to live, as Jesus Christ to live in him. For they only that are led by the Spirit of Christ, are the true sons of God. As I observed before, so I tell you again, the faith which we preach is not a dead, but a lively active faith wrought in the soul, working a thorough change, by the power of the Holy Ghost, in the whole man. And unless Christ be thus in you, notwithstanding you may be orthodox as to the foregoing principles, notwithstanding you may have good desires, and attend constantly on the means of grace. Yet, in St. Paul's opinion, you are out of a state of salvation. Know you not, says that apostle to the Corinthians, a church famous for its gifts above any church under heaven, that Christ is in you, by his Spirit, unless you are reprobates. For Christ came not only to save us from the guilt, but from the power of our sins, till he has done this, however he may be a savior to others, we can have no assurance of well-grounded hope, that he has saved us, for it is by receiving his blessed spirit into our hearts, and feeling him witnessing with our spirits, that we are the sons of God, that we can be certified of our being sealed to the day of redemption. This is a great mystery, but I speak of Christ and the new birth. Marvel not at my asking you, what you think about Christ being formed within you. For either God must change his nature, or we ours. For as in Adam we all have spiritually died, so all that are effectually saved by Christ, must in Christ be spiritually made alive. His only end in and rising again, and interceding for us now in heaven, is to redeem us from the misery of our fallen nature, and, by the operation of his blessed spirit, to make us meet to be partakers of the heavenly inheritance with the saints in light. None but those that thus are changed by his grace here, shall appear with him in glory hereafter. Examine yourselves, therefore, my brethren, whether you are in the faith, prove yourselves, and think it not sufficient to say in your creed, I believe in Jesus Christ. Many say so, who do not believe, who are reprobates, and yet in a state of death. You take God's name in vain, when you call him Father, and your prayers are turned into sin, unless you believe in Christ, so as to have your life hid with him in God, and to receive life and nourishment from him, as branches do from the vine. I know, indeed, the men of this generation deny there is any such thing as feeling Christ within them, but alas! To what a dreadful condition would such reduce us, even to the state of the abandoned heathen, who, St. Paul tells us, were past feel. Ing. The Apostle prays, that the Ephesians may abound in all knowledge and spiritual understanding, or as it might be rendered, spiritual sensation. And in the office for the visitation of the sick, the minister prays, that the Lord may make the sick person know and feel that there is not other name under heaven given unto men, in whom and through whom they may receive health and salvation, but only the name of our Lord Jesus. For there is a spiritual, as well as a corporeal feeling, and though this is not communicated to us in a sensible manner, as outward objects affect our senses, yet it is as real as any sensible or visible sensation, and may be as truly felt and discerned by the soul as any impression from without can be felt by the body. All who are born again of God, know that I lie not. What think you, sirs, did Naaman feel, when he was cured of his leprosy? 
Did the woman feel virtue coming out of Jesus Christ, when she touched the hem of his garment, and was cured of her bloody issue? So surely mayest thou feel, O believer, when Jesus Christ dwelleth in thy heart. I pray God to make you all know and feel this, ere you depart hence. O my brethren, my heart is enlarged towards you. I trust I feel something of that hidden, but powerful presence of Christ, whilst I am preaching to you. Indeed it is sweet, it is exceedingly comfortable. All the harm I wish you, who without cause are my enemies, is, that you felt the like. Believe me, though it would be hell to my soul, to return to a natural state again, yet I would willingly change status with you for a little while, that you might know what it is to have Christ dwelling in your hearts by faith. Do not turn your backs. Do not let the devil hurry you away. Be not afraid of convictions. Do not think worse of the doctrine, because preached without the church walls. Our Lord, I the days of his flesh, preached on a mount, in a ship, and a field, and I am persuaded, many have felt his gracious presence here. Indeed we speak what we know. Do not reject the kingdom of God against yourselves. Be so wise as to receive our witness. I cannot, I will not let you go. Stay a little, let us reason together. However lightly you may esteem your souls, I know our Lord has set an unspeakable value on them. He thought them worthy of his most precious blood. I beseech you, therefore, O sinners, be ye reconciled to God. I hope you do not fear being accepted in the Beloved. Behold, he calleth you. Behold, he prevents and follows you with his mercy, and hath sent forth his servants unto the highways and hedges, to compel you to come in. Remember then, that at such an hour of such a day, in such a year, in this place, you were all told what you ought to think concerning Jesus Christ. If you now perish, it will not be for lack of knowledge. I am free from the blood of you all. You cannot say I have been preaching damnation to you. You cannot say I have, like legal preachers, been requiring you to make brick without straw. I have not bidden you to make yourselves saints, and then come to God but I have offered you salvation on as cheap terms as you can desire. I have offered you Christ's whole wisdom, Christ's whole righteousness, Christ's whole sanctification and eternal redemption, if you will but believe on him. If you say, you cannot believe, you say right. For faith, as well as every other blessing, is the gift of God. But then wait upon God, and who knows but he may have mercy on thee. Why do we not entertain more loving thoughts of Christ? Or do you think he will have mercy on others, and not on you? But are you not sinners? And did not Jesus Christ come into the world to save sinners? If you say you are the chief of sinners, I answer, that will be no hindrance to your salvation, indeed it will not, if you lay hold on him by faith. Read the evangelists and see how kindly he behaved to his disciples who fled from and denied him. Go tell my brethren, says he. He did not say, go tell, those traitors. But, go tell my brethren in general, and poor Peter in particular. Boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. That hath made a new and living way for thee. Thou shalt not die. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 and 20. Besides, Jesus is there, not only to sprinkle the mercy seat with his blood, but he speaks, and his blood speaks. He hath audience, and his blood hath audience, insomuch that God saith, when he doth but see the blood, he will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you, Exodus chapter 12 verse 13. I shall not detain you any longer be sober and humble. Go to the Father in the name of the Son, and tell him your case, in the assistance of the Spirit. And you will then feel the benefit of praying with the Spirit and with the understanding also. C. A word of reproof 1. This speaks sadly to you who never pray at all. I will pray, saith the Apostle, and so saith the heart of them that are Christians. 
Thou then art not a Christian that art not a praying person. The promise is that every one that is righteous shall pray. Psalms 32-6. Thou then art a wicked wretch that prayest not. Jacob got the name of Israel by wrestling with God. Genesis chapter 32. And all his children bear that name with him. Galatians chapter 6 verse 16. But the people that forget prayer, that call not on the name of the Lord, they have prayer made for them. But it is such as this, pour out thy fury upon the heathen, O Lord, and upon the families that call not on thy name. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 25. How lickest thou this? O thou that art so far off from pouring out thine heart before God, that thou goest to bed like a dog, and risest like a hog, or a sot, and forgettest to call upon God. What wilt thou do when thou shalt be damned in hell, because thou couldst not find in thine heart to ask for heaven? Who will grieve for thy sorrow, that didst not count mercy worth asking for? I tell thee, the ravens and the dogs shall rise up in judgment against thee, for they will, according to their kind, make signs and a noise for something to refresh them when they want it. But thou hast not the heart to ask for heaven, though thou must eternally perish in hell if thou hast it not. 2. This rebukes you that make it your business to slight, mock it, and undervalue the spirit, and praying by that. What will you do when God shall come to reckon for these things? You count it high treason to speak but a word against the king. Nay, you tremble at the thought of it, and yet in the meantime you will blaspheme the Spirit of the Lord. Is God indeed to be dallied with, and will the end be pleasant unto you? Did God send his Holy Spirit into the hearts of his people to that end that you should taunt at it? Is this to serve God? And doth this demonstrate the reformation of your church? Nay, is it not the mark of implacable reprobates? O oh, fearful, can you not be content to be damned for your sins against the law, but you must sin against the Holy Ghost? Must the holy, harmless, and undefiled spirit of grace, the nature of God, the promise of Christ, the comforter of his children, that without which no man can do any service acceptable to the Father, must this, I say, be the burden of your song, to taunt, deride, and mock at? If God sent Korah and his company headlong to hell for speaking against Moses and Aaron, do you that mock at the Spirit of Christ think to escape unpunished? Numbers 16. And Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29. Did you never read what God did to Ananias and Sapphira for telling but one lie against it? Acts chapter 5 verse 1 to 8. Also to Simon Magus for but undervaluing of it. Acts chapter 8 verse 18 to 22. And will thy sin be a virtue, or go unrewarded with vengeance, that mockest it thy business to rage against and oppose its office, service, and help that it giveth unto the children of God? It is a fearful thing to do despite unto the Spirit of grace. Compare Matthew chapter 12 verse 31 with Mark chapter 3 verse 28 to 30. 3. As this is the doom of those who do openly blaspheme the Holy Ghost, in a way of disdain five and reproach to its office and service, so also it is sad for you, who resist. The spirit of prayer, by a form of man's inventing. It is a very juggle of the devil that the traditions of men should be of better esteem and more to be owned than the spirit of prayer. What is this less than that accursed abomination of Jeroboam, which kept many from going to Jerusalem, the place and way of God's appointment to worship, and by that means brought such displeasure from God upon them as to this day is not appeased? 1 Kings chapter 12 verse 26 to 33. One would think that God's judgments of old upon the hypocrites of that day should make them that have heard of such things take heed and fear to do so. Yet the doctors of our day are so far from taking of warning by the punishment of others, that they do most desperately rush into the same transgression, namely, to set up an institution of man, neither commanded nor commended of God, 
and whosoever will not obey herein, they must be driven either out of the land or the world. Hath God required these things at your hands? If he hath, show us where. If not, as I am sure he hath not, then what cursed presumption is it in any pope, bishop, or other, to command that in the worship of God which he hath not required? Nay, further, it is not that part only of the form, which is several texts of scripture that we are commanded to say, but even all must be confessed as the divine worship of God, notwithstanding those absurdities contained therein, which because they are at large discovered by others, I omit the rehearsal of them. Again, though a man be willing to live never so peaceably, yet because he cannot, for conscience's sake, own that for one of the most eminent parts of God's worship, which he never commanded, therefore must that man be looked upon as factious, seditious, erroneous, heretical, a disparagement to the church, a seducer of the people, and what not. Lord, what will be the fruit of these things, when for the doctrine of God there is imposed, that is, more than taught, the traditions of men? Thus is the spirit of prayer disowned, and the form imposed, the spirit debased, and the form extolled. They that pray with the spirit, though never so humble and holy, counted fanatics, and they that pray with the form, though with that only, counted the virtuous. And how will the favorers of such a practice answer that scripture, which commandeth that the church should turn away from such as have a form of godliness, and deny the power thereof, 2 t 3 to 5. And if I should say that men that do these things aforesaid, do advance a form of prayer of other men's making above the spirit of prayer, it would not take long time to prove it. For he that advanceth the book of common prayer above the spirit of prayer, he doth advance a form of men's making above it. But this do all those who banish, or desire to banish them that pray with the spirit of prayer, while they hug and embrace them that pray by that form only, and that because they do it. Therefore, they love and advance the form of their own or others inventing, before the spirit of prayer, which is God's special and gracious appointment. If you desire, more proof. Look into the jails in England, and into the alehouses of the same. And I trow six you will find those that plead for the spirit of prayer in the jail, and them that look after the form of men's inventions only in the alehouse. It is evident also by the silencing of God's dear ministers, though never so powerfully enabled by the spirit of prayer, if they in conscience cannot admit of that form of common prayer. If this be not an exalting the common prayer book above either praying by the Spirit, or preaching the Word, I have taken my mark amiss. It is not pleasant for me to dwell on this. The Lord in mercy turn the hearts of the people to seek more after the Spirit of prayer, and in the strength of that, to pour out their souls before the Lord. Only let me say it is a sad sign that that which is one of the most eminent parts of the pretended woe. Our ship of God is anti-Christian, when it hath nothing but the tradition of men and the strength of persecution to uphold or plead for it. 5. Conclusion I shall conclude this discourse with this word of advice to all God's people. 1. Believe that as sure as you are in the way of God you must meet with temptations. 2. The first day therefore that thou dost enter into Christ's congregation, look for them. 3. When they do come, beg of God to carry thee through them. 4. Be jealous of thine own heart, that it deceive thee not in thy evidences for heaven, nor in thy walking with God in this world. 5. Take heed of the flatteries of false brethren. 6. Keep in the life and power of truth. 7. Look most at the things which are not seen. 8. Take heed of little sins. 9. Keep the promise warm upon thy heart. 10. Renew thy acts of faith in the blood of Christ. 11. Consider the work of thy generation. 12. Count to run with the foremost therein. Grace be with thee. Boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. That hath made a new and living way for thee.
Thou shalt not die. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 and 20. Besides, Jesus is there, not only to sprinkle the mercy seat with his blood, but he speaks, and his blood speaks. He hath audience, and his blood hath audience, insomuch that God saith, When he doth but see the blood, he will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you. Exodus chapter 12 verse 13. I shall not detain you any longer. Be sober and humble. Go to the Father in the name of the Son, and tell him your case, in the assistance of the Spirit. And you will then feel the benefit of praying with the Spirit and with the understanding also. C. A word of reproof 1. This speaks sadly to you who never pray at all. I will pray, saith the Apostle, and so saith the heart of them that are Christians. Thou then art not a Christian that art not a praying person. The promise is that every one that is righteous shall pray, Psalms 32-6. Thou then art a wicked wretch that prayest not. Jacob got the name of Israel by wrestling with God, Genesis chapter 32. And all his children bear that name with him, Galatians chapter 6 verse 16. But the people that forget prayer, that call not on the name of the Lord, they have prayer made for them. But it is such as this, pour out thy fury upon the heathen, O Lord, and upon the families that call not on thy name, Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 25. How lickest thou this? O thou that art so far off from pouring out thine heart before God, that thou goest to bed like a dog, and risest like a hog, or a sot, and forgettest to call upon God. What wilt thou do when thou shalt be damned in hell? because thou couldst not find in thine heart to ask for heaven. Who will grieve for thy sorrow, that didst not count mercy worth asking for? I tell thee, the ravens and the dogs shall rise up in judgment against thee, for they will, according to their kind, make signs and a noise for something to refresh them when they want it. But thou hast not the heart to ask for heaven, though thou must eternally perish in hell if thou hast it not. 2. This rebukes you that make it your business to slight, mock it, and undervalue the spirit, and praying by that. What will you do when God shall come to reckon for these things? You count it high treason to speak but a word against the king. Nay, you tremble at the thought of it, and yet in the meantime you will blaspheme the spirit of the Lord. Is God indeed to be dallied with, and will the end be pleasant unto you? Did God send his Holy Spirit into the hearts of his people to that end that you should taunt at it? Is this to serve God? And doth this demonstrate the reformation of your church? Nay, is it not the mark of implacable reprobates? O oh, fearful, can you not be content to be damned for your sins against the law, but you must sin against the Holy Ghost? Must the holy, harmless, and undefiled Spirit of grace, the nature of God, the promise of Christ, the comforter of his children, that without w. Hitch no man can do any service acceptable to the Father. Must this, I say, be the burden of your song, to taunt, deride, and mock at? If God sent Korah and his company headlong to hell for speaking against Moses and Aaron, do you that mock at the Spirit of Christ think to escape unpunished? Numbers 16 and Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29. Did you never read what God did to Ananias and Sapphira for telling but one lie against it? Acts chapter 5 verse 1 to 8. Also to Simon Magus for but undervaluing of it? Acts chapter 8 verse 18 to 22. And will thy sin be a virtue, or go unrewarded with vengeance, that mockest it thy business to rage against and oppose its office? service, and help that it giveth unto the children of God. It is a fearful thing to do despite unto the Spirit of grace. Compare Matthew chapter 12 verse 31 with Mark chapter 3 verse 28 to 30. 3. As this is the doom of those who do openly blaspheme the Holy Ghost, in a way of disdain five and reproach to its office and service, so also it is sad for you 
who resist the spirit of prayer, by a form of man's inventing. It is a very juggle of the devil that the traditions of men should be of better esteem and more to be owned than the spirit of prayer. What is this less than that accursed abomination of Jeroboam, which kept many from going to Jerusalem, the place and way of God's appointment to worship, and by that means brought such displeasure from God upon them as to this day is not appeased? 1 Kings chapter 12 verse 26 to 33. One would think that God's judgments of old upon the hypocrites of that day should make them that have heard of such things take heed and fear to do so. Yet the doctors of our day are so far from taking of warning by the punishment of others, that they do most desperately rush into the same transgression, namely, to set up an institution of man, neither commanded nor commended of God, and whosoever will not obey herein they must be driven either out of the land or the world. Hath God required these things at your hands? If he hath, show us where. If not, as I am sure he hath not, then what cursed presumption is it in any pope, bishop, or other, to command that in the worship of God which he hath not required? Nay, further, it is not that part only of the form, which is several texts of scripture that we are commanded to say, but even all must be confessed as the divine worship of God, notwithstanding those absurdities contained therein, which because they are at large discovered by others, I omit the rehearsal of them. Again, though a man be willing to live never so peaceably, yet because he cannot, for conscience's sake, own that for one of the most eminent parts of God's worship, which he never commanded, Therefore must that man be looked upon as factious, seditious, erroneous, heretical, a disparagement to the church, a seducer of the people, and what not. Lord, what will be the fruit of these things, when for the doctrine of God there is imposed, that is, more than taught, the traditions of men? Thus is the spirit of prayer disowned, and the form imposed, the spirit debased, and the form extolled. They that pray with the Spirit, though never so humble and holy, counted fanatics. And they that pray with the form, though with that only, counted the virtuous. And how will the favorers of such a practice answer that scripture, which commandeth that the church should turn away from such as have a form of godliness, and deny the power thereof? 2 T 3 to 5. And if I should say that men that do these things aforesaid, do advance a form of prayer of other men's making above the spirit of prayer, it would not take long time to prove it. For he that advanceth the book of common prayer above the spirit of prayer, he doth advance a form of men's making above it. But this do all those who banish, or desire to banish them that pray with the spirit of prayer, while they hug and embrace them that pray by that form only, and that because they do it. Therefore, they love and advance the form of their own or others inventing. g. Before the spirit of prayer, which is God's special and gracious appointment. If you desire, more proof. Look into the jails in England, and into the alehouses of the same. And I trow six you will find those that plead for the spirit of prayer in the jail, and them that look after the form of men's inventions only in the alehouse. It is evident also by the silencing of God's dear ministers, though never so powerfully enabled by the spirit of prayer, if they in conscience cannot admit of that form of common prayer. If this be not an exalting the common prayer book above either praying by the spirit, or preaching the word, I have taken my mark amiss. It is not pleasant for me to dwell on this. The Lord in mercy turn the hearts of the people to seek more after the spirit of prayer and in the strength of that, to pour out their souls before the Lord. Only let me say it is a sad sign that that which is one of the most eminent parts of the pretended worship of God is anti-Christian, when it hath nothing but the tradition of men in the strength of persecution to uphold or plead for it. 5. Conclusion I shall conclude this discourse with this word of advice to all God's people. 1. Believe that as sure as you are in the way of God you must meet with temptations. 2. 
The first day therefore that thou dost enter into Christ's congregation, look for them. 3. When they do come, beg of God to carry thee through them. 4. Be jealous of thine own heart, that it deceive thee not in thy evidences for heaven, nor in thy walking with God in this world. 5. Take heed of the flatteries of false brethren. 6. Keep in the life and power of truth. 7. Look most at the things which are not seen. 8. Take heed of little sins. 9. Keep the promise warm upon thy heart. 10. Renew thy acts of faith in the blood of Christ. 11. Consider the work of thy generation. 12. Count to run with the foremost therein. Grace be with thee.